Let us pray. Our Father, we come before you this day with great expectation. We know you are interested in people who have the true attitude and a longing attitude, desiring to be touched by you. And this day we are asking for a touch from heaven in Jesus' name. Except you remove the scales in our eyes spiritually, we remain blind. And except to touch our hearts, the heart will remain hard. And Father, what we are asking today is that what we cannot do ourselves, and what people cannot do for us in changing our hearts, in enlightening us, in opening our eyes and removing the scales of our eyes, we are asking you do it for us today in Jesus' name. As we hear your word, we are praying that the evil one, the devil, will not pick up your word from our hearts in Jesus' name. As we hear, make us understand. As we understand, help us to come before you requesting that you do for us what the word presents as necessary, important, and essential before we see you. Father, we pray that no one here, leader, zona leader, area leader, house fellowship leader, or anyone whatever, will allow the devil to rob him or her of the blessing of this day. Draw us nearer to yourself. In Jesus' name we pray. Matthew chapter 5 was still on the message of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm sure you understand why. Jesus Christ is Savior, is Lord, is King, is Judge, and is the one we're going to face on the last day. And we're spending this time, we're spending this period uh, to re examine again the things that He said before He left. So that on the judgment day there will be no surprises that will make us to be bad away from the Almighty God in eternity. Reading from verse 1 to verse 12, we know that Jesus Christ was laying the foundation to the Christian faith. And now as we come to verse 8, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. As we come to this verse, we want to understand that from the beginning and to the end of the Bible, there is this universal testimony to the fact that purity is profitable. And I'm looking at this verse from perhaps an angle you have never seen it before. I'm actually looking at the profit in purity. And I've just told you now that from the very beginning, Genesis to the very end, Revelation of the Bible, it's just a constant universal testimony, a united testimony from all the patriarchs, the people, the prophets, the preachers, that purity is profitable. The promises, the commandments, the visions, the revelations, the experiences, the sermons, the testimonies of the Bible, all confirm it. Noah. Abraham, Moses, Joshua, Samuel, Isaiah, Daniel, Peter, John, Paul, and a myriad of all other people in the Bible, they all unite to proclaim to us that purity is, is profitable. And Christ here assures us that purity brings you face to face with God. Now, as I talk about profiting in purity, turn with me to some passages of the Bible. In Job chapter 22, verses 2 and 3, Can a man be profitable unto God, as he that is wise may be profitable unto himself? Now you see, in that passage you are being told that you can be profitable to yourself and not profitable to God. And obviously you can be profitable to yourself and not to society sometimes. But you know, purity makes you profitable to yourself, to your family, to people around, and, and we go further, to God as well. In verse 3, is there any pleasure to the Almighty that thou art righteous? Oh yes. 
is there it gain to him that thou makest thy way perfect? Sure. Chapter 35 of Job. Verses 3 and 4. For thou sayest, What advantage will it be unto thee? And what profit shall I have if I be cleansed from my sin? I will answer thee and thy companions with thee. Now you have been saying, What is the advantage? What is the profit? If I be cleansed from sin and in the statement of scriptures, that's why we're here this morning. I will answer you. That is, I will tell you the profit in purity, the advantage in holiness. And I will also answer your companions. In Acts chapter 20, reading from verse 20, Acts 20, verse 20. How I kept nothing back that was profitable unto you, but I've showed you and I've taught you publicly and from house to house. As leaders and as preachers of the gospel, whatever is profitable to our hearers, to our people, we should not keep back from them. And in scripture, purity is profitable. And that is why this morning we're taking time to open it unto you in First Timothy chapter 4, verse 8. But bodily exercise profiteth little, but godliness is profitable unto all things, having the promise of the life that now is, and of that which is to come. The prophet in purity, in holiness, in the right type of life or lifestyle between us and God is for the life that now is and for that which is to come. That means it's profitable in time and in eternity. In Hebrews chapter 12, Verses 9 and 10. Furthermore, we are that fathers of our flesh which correcteth us, and we give them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? For they verily, that is, our human fathers, for a few days chastened, chastened us after their own pleasure, but He, our Heavenly Father God, for our profit, that we might be partakers of his holiness. All these scriptures confirm that holiness or purity is profitable. Profitable in our lives now and profitable in our life in the future when we go to meet the Lord face to face. God delights in those who are conformed to the image of Christ. To see the kingdom of God, we must be born again. But to see God in that kingdom, we must have pure hearts. God is the holy God, and only the pure in heart will see God in his kingdom. Now let me ask, what does it mean to be pure in heart? Is it possible today? If it's possible today, how? Is it by human achievement or by divine accomplishment? Are there examples in the Bible of those who are pure? And can we find examples today of those who are pure in heart? If it's a divine work of grace, is there any human factor connected with it? When eventually we obtain, if it's at all possible to obtain, how is it maintained? And what's the benefit of the purity of heart if we eventually possess it? These questions lead up to the following six points of consideration. A proper perception. A perfect provision. Purified persons. 
personal preparation, persistent prayer, and promised privilege. Before we can really understand what the Lord is saying when he said, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. We must have a proper perception. Having the proper perception, there is a question we want to answer. And that is, is it by human achievement or by a divine accomplishment? And that is why we're considering the perfect provision. And then we want to see whether there are examples of those who have received such an experience. That's why we're considering the purified persons. And then, what's the human factor? In what way are we connected? What can we do? As we want to get this purity of heart, that's why we consider personal preparation. And since it's God doing it, we need to consider persistent prayer. Then, what's the profit? What's the gain? What's the advantage? If I become pure in heart, then we'll see the promised privilege. Now, to understand what Jesus meant when he said, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. I want to consider the meaning of these two words, pure and hard. Let's understand to start with that Jesus was talking about the heart. You know, there is a hedge faith. And there are many people that, you know, they concentrate on only perception with the head. And then there is the hand faith. There are people that are connected, on, concerned only with performance of the hands. But the Lord is not talking of the head or the hand, He's talking of the heart. He's talking of purity, not only perception of the head, or the brain, or the understanding, or the intellect, not only performance of the hands, only activities of religion or Christianity. He's talking about real purity, perfection in the inward parts. And so He says, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. What does the word pure mean? The word in Greek is kataros, and um, it's from the Latin uh, version of that word you get, chaste, which means clean from fear, or cleansed, or clear, or free, or innocent, or meat, or alloyed. And when you read your Bible, you come across the use of the word fear in so very many ways. And with many other words, for example, in Exodus chapter 27, verse 20, it talks of pure oil. What does that mean? Oil not mixed with another type. Unmixed, pure, cleansed, properly prepared. In Exodus chapter 25, verse 11, as well as Revelation 21, 21, it talks of pure gold. What does that mean? Unalloyed, unmixed, completely clean, completely pure. Pure gold. Then it talks of pure wool in Daniel chapter 7, verse 9. What's pure wool? It means, uh, you know, there is no fake we say it. There is no counterfeit with it. It's totally pure. And it's totally white without a thread of black in it. In Malachi chapter 1 verse 11, it talks of a pure offering, undefiled, but totally clean, without blemish, without spot. And in Revelation 22 1, it talks of pure water. Revelation 15 6, it talks of pure leaning. And then in Psalm 12 verse 6, it talks of pure words. In Job chapter 11 verse 4, it talks of pure doctrine. Now, think about it. When you mention the word pure, I've just told you that with the use of the word pure in the Bible, it means it's clean from filth, it, it's cleansed from defilement, it's clear completely. It's like, you know, when you, when you burn gold or when you just put gold on the fire in purifying gold. And you purify that gold until it's so pure you can see your image or your picture in that gold. So when it says pure, it's talking of something cleansed, something totally clear, something totally free and totally innocent. And there is no form of defilement or spot or wrinkle in it. Pure oil, pure gold, pure wool, pure offering, pure water, pure leaning, pure words, pure doctrine, and now pure heart. The meaning comes out well in the usage as we're seeing. And when God speaks of a pure heart, 
there is no doubt about what he means. Now, in Proverbs chapter 22, verse 11. Proverbs 22, verse 11. He that loveth pureness of heart, for the grace of his slaves, the king shall be his friend. Pureness, not head, not hand, not just outward behavior, in the heart. Pureness of heart. Cleanliness in the heart. Holiness in the heart. And in Lamentation chapter 4, Verse 7. And Nazarites were purer than snow. They were whiter than milk. They were more ruddy in body than rubies. Their polishing was of sapphire. It's still bringing out the meaning of the word peel. It says when something is peel, there is no defilement in it. There is no spot in it. There is no evil in it. It's white. Whiter than anything you can think about to be white. It's purer. Purer than anything you can think about to be pure. And in this verse 8 of Matthew chapter 5, Blessed are the pure in heart. I've told you now the meaning of the word pure. Uh, what's the meaning of the word heart? When we say heart, what does it mean? In Psalm 15. Verse 2. He that walketh uprightly and walketh righteousness and speaketh the truth in his heart. Now compare that verse with Psalm 51. Verse 6. Speaketh the truth in his heart. Now Psalm 51 verse 6. Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts. Psalm 15 says, truth in the heart. Psalm 51 says, truth in the inward parts. When you compare both uh, statements together, it means the heart is the inward part of man. In fact, in Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23, Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23, Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. What well, then is the heart? The heart is the center of your personality. The heart is the center of man's being. The, the heart is the seat of affection, the seat of all desires, the seat of all behavior. Is the fountain from which flows everything else. Is in what part? Is the very essence of you. And it's a hidden part. And you know in Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12. The last part of verse 34 says, Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. That's still confirming the fact that the heart is a fountain of all your behavior. It's a source of all your activities. A good man, verse 35, out of the good treasure bringeth forth good things. And an evil man, out of the evil treasure of the heart, bringeth forth evil things. In Matthew chapter 15, verse 19. For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. These are the things which defile a man. It's telling us again that the heart is just the fountain from which everything is flowing. Therefore the psalmist was praying in Psalm 51 verse 10. Psalm 51 verse 10. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. What are we saying? We're saying that God is concerned with the heart. And when Jesus said, Blessed are the pure in heart, you know what he meant? He meant, Blessed are those who are pure, not merely on the surface, but in the center of their being, at the very source of their every activity. 
Many people like the Pharisees of old are merely concerned about outward appearances, external injunctions of Christianity. They are neglecting the inward healing condition of the heart. But Jesus is seriously concerned about the heart. I told you before, the true Christian faith is not a matter of perception with the head. Reading the Bible through in one year. Understanding Greek and Hebrew. Knowing the doctrines of the Bible. Your perception, understanding with the intellect, with the head, it gets you nowhere. Or just performance of the hands, activity, conduct, work. But Jesus is very concerned with purity of heart. And let me ask you the question. Does a Christian face, does a Christian activity, does a Christian profession go beyond perception with the head? Understanding of doctrine. Understanding of Bible passages, asking questions from the Bible and answering the questions from the Bible. Being able to point to the Bible about anything that you want to refer to. Being able to counsel, being able to preach, being able to witness. Just understanding what the head. Does the Christian faith or profession go beyond your head? Does it go beyond performance of the hand, activity, playing musical instruments, conducting music, working as an usher? Working as an area leader, working as a zonal leader, working as a coordinator. Does your Christian profession go beyond just the performance of the hand, activities, external injunctions of Christianity? Do you have the purity of heart, my brother, my sister? That is what God and Jesus are concerned about. Blessed are the pure in heart, for only they shall see God. A born again, you need to, to be see the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God, you must be born again. But then, to see God in that kingdom, while you have entered, you must be pure in heart. It's one thing to be saved. It's another thing, a second step to be sanctified. Understanding Bible doctrines intellectually is not enough. External activities and outward conduct are not sufficient. Don't be deceived. The important question is, what is the state of your heart? The pure in heart are those who are purified, listen to me, from every unholy affection. Unholy affection, unholy desires, unholy ambition in your heart. Are they still there? Are you purified from it? Cleansed from all filthiness. The Bible talks of being purified from every filthiness of the flesh and the spirit. To be pure in heart means to be free from anger because anger comes from the fountain of the heart. From the source, the heart. Are you free? Are you pure from every unholy affection? Are you cleansed from all filthiness? I'm not talking of just filthiness in your language. That's the offshoot of what is going on on the inside. You know, sometimes, uh, you know, a toilet can be there and you can put perfume and put many things on the outside of the toilet. And even though the toilet within is very corrupt and defiled and very polluted and, uh, you know, smelling. But, you know, because of what you put on the outside, everything may look nice and look clean and look white. And on the outside, you may look clean and white in your language, in your behavior, in your character, in your morals. But the question I'm asking you this morning is, what's the condition of your heart? Is it like the toilet? Sweat on the outside, clean on the outside, sparkling on the outside, even giving us a good smell on the outside. But yet, inwardly and internally and hidden beyond the surface, there is so much corruption and defilement. How are you? How is it in your heart? You know, Jesus is really concerned about this. As he said, blessed are the pure in heart. And you know, the Greek says, only they shall see the Lord. Are you free from anger? From pride? From every unholy, unkind temper and passion? In a pure heart, there is nothing contrary to the love of God. Only God can give us this pure heart we're talking about in answer to the believer's prayer of faith. You know, human culture, training, or education cannot purify the heart. There must be a work of divine grace. Now you understand what it means to be pure in heart. But what provision has God made? That brings me to the next point. Perfect provision. Perfect provision. In Deuteronomy chapter 30, and I'm reading there in verse 6. 
and the Lord thy God will circumcise thine heart and the heart of thy seed, the love of God, to, the, to love the Lord your God with all thine heart and with all thy soul, and that thou mayest live. No doubt many of us parents have seen children when these children are just born. The male children. And they are circumcised. The question is, can that little child circumcise himself? The answer is no. And even when you have become old, as old as 10 or 20 or 30 or 40, if you have not been circumcised, can you do it yourself? The answer is no. And the same thing with the circumcision of the heart. When Jesus talked about, you know, the pure in heart, it's not saying that, you know, we, we go to try it on our own. Go to attempt it on our own. It's the work of God. And there's a perfect provision that God has made. And it says, the Lord your God. Only There's the work of God. The Lord your God will circumcise thine heart. Listen to me. In the physical if when you were young as a little child, you have not been circumcised, you can go to school, you can go to secondary school, you can go to university, you can become a professor, a great man of learning, a great man in a scientific field. But you know, science alone by itself will not circumcise you physically if you do not present yourself for circumcision. You can go to seminary or anywhere. The seminary will not circumcise you in the physical if you don't present yourself. And it's the same thing in the spiritual. You can read the Bible. You can come to church. You can even read, you know, the whole Bible and read in Greek and read in Hebrew. And you can do everything you can do spiritually. And all that you do in your own effort will not be able to circumcise your heart. This is the work of God. The Lord thy God will circumcise your heart. You might have been a Christian for 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. If you have not gone to the Lord this second time after you are saved, to take it away, the defilement, the original pollution of the heart. You know, it will never be done. You can be coming here learning doctrine and, you know, learning step upon step and just learn it in the head and getting involved with house fellowship system, getting involved with witnessing and publicity and everything. But if you never present yourself to the Lord, you know, your heart will not be circumcised. It's the work of God. The Lord, the Lord, the Lord your God will circumcise thine heart and the heart of thy seed to love the Lord your God with all your heart. And with all your soul, that thou mayest live. That's why uh, the psalmist was praying in Psalm 51, verse 7. Purge me with easel, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. I can neither wash myself in Jordan, Papa, or Abana. I cannot wash myself with the blood of bullocks and bulls and goats or, or sheep to be clean. Neither can I wash myself with the educational system of the land to cleanse my heart, to purify my soul. But, O oh Lord, this is your work alone. Pour me with this soap and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. In verse 10, create in me a clean heart, O oh God, and renew a right spirit within me. You hear that? It's a matter for prayer. It's a matter for a spiritual concern. It's a matter for looking up to God because only God can do it. This is the work of God. And He has made a perfect provision. You know, in uh, Ezekiel chapter 36. Ezekiel chapter 36. I'm reading from verse 25. There will I sprinkle clean water upon you. That's God talking. He knows you can't do it yourself. To be pure in heart. There's no way you can do it. But he says then, Will I sprinkle clean water upon you? And ye shall be clean. From all your filthiness, from all your idols, will I cleanse you. A new heart also will I give you. And a new spirit will I put within you, and I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh. And I will give you an heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes. And ye shall keep my judgments and do them. 
you know, if you're if you're a newcomer to this church, let me help you and tell you something. In various places, all you need to do to become a member of that church is to, you know, sign a card and then be known to the pastor. And after you are known to the pastor, you just come in and out with them, and everybody knows you, and you know, they call you by the name, they call everybody, you're a brother, you're a sister, because you're a member of that church. But you know, it's a pity you can be a member of a physical outward earthly church, and not be a member of the invisible church, the company of those who are redeemed and purified by the blood of Jesus Christ. And you know, as you come, it's wonderful you are coming, but you know, that is not the end of it. You know, the Lord himself has promised to do something. He says, I will sprinkle clean water upon you. It's not the water of baptism. This is not coming to a river with the pastor. This is not the pastor's work. Purity of heart is the work of God. I cannot do it for you. Listen to me. I cannot even do it for myself. It's only God can keep me pure and make me pure. If the preacher cannot do it for himself, you think he can do it for you? Never. It's the work of God and he says, I will sprinkle clean water upon you and ye shall be clean. He says, if you find yourself unclean, it means I have not done it yet. Because when God does it, it is done. The heart is clean, the motives are clean, the ambitions are clean. And all, everything in your heart becomes pure and then the outward actions are pure as well. And he says, I will cleanse you from all your filthiness, and from all your idols will I cleanse you. Then he says, I will put a new heart within you, a new spirit I will put within you. I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh, and I will make you to walk in my ways. But you know what he says in verse 37? Verse 37, Thus says the Lord God, I will yet for this be inquired up by the house of Israel to do it for them. They say, well, if God says he will do it, let him do it. But he says, I will not do it except you ask him. I promise to do it. I made the provision. It's a perfect provision. I can sanctify. I can purify. But there is no way it can be done. Listen to me. There is no way it can be done. If you don't pray... And you know, my heart reaches out to our workers. I'm really very concerned about our workers. Because, you know, you can be listening to me while I'm preaching, and immediately we finish the meeting, you're, you're all about in activities again. And my question to you is, when do you have the time to pray, to ask the Lord? You said you will purify us, you said you will sanctify us, you said you will take away the uncleanness, the pollution, the defilement away from our heart. Do it for us. When do you have time to do that as a worker, as a zona leader, area leader, house fellowship leader? When do you have the time to pray as an usher, as a member of the choir? And yet, if you never pray about it, God will not do it for you and then you'll not be able to see God at last because blessed are the pure in heart only they shall see God are you purified in heart after you've been saved have you come to the Lord saying oh Lord here am I do it for me but I've told you it's the work of God I said chapter 61 I said chapter 61 I'm reading for as the hell as the earth bringeth forth a bird, and as the garden causes the things that are sown in it to spring forth, so the Lord God, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to spring forth before the nations. It's the work of God. He wants to do it. He can do it. And he will do it when we pray, when we ask him in Ephesians chapter 5. Verses 25 to 27. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and he gave himself for it. What did he give himself for the church? That he might sanctify. The word means purify, make holy. That he might sanctify and cleanse it of the washing of water by the word. The difference between the word that proceeds out of the mouth of God directly into your heart, telling you you are cleansed. Like the word came to Isaiah saying, your sin is purged. And then the word that comes out of the preacher, you know, all the preacher can do is enlighten you, talk to you, read the Bible to you, and then make you to go on your knees. But then it's still you that will go and pray and talk to the Lord about it. This is the word proceeding out of the mouth of God, out of the mouth of Jesus. 
that is cleansing you, that he might sanctify and cleanse it of the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but it should be holy and without blemish. It takes that to see God. Holy, without spot, without wrinkle. I told you that's the meaning of the word pure. So pure means you are free from defilement. You are cleansed from evil. You are innocent from everything that is known as sin, inwardly and outwardly. And you are completely unmixed and alloyed. It's not a mixture of divine grace and human fault and human failure and human imperfection. It's just the mind of Christ reproduced in you again. And that brings you to be glorious without spot, without wrinkle, without blemish, without any such thing. And in Titus chapter 2, verse 14, who gave himself for us. Why? What did he give himself? That he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. God's provision is perfect in every sense. And it's available to, for everyone who truly desires age. God saves through Christ. But he does not stop at salvation. He sanctifies and he purifies the heart of the believer. Yes, he can make us inwardly holy. Holy enough to live in the immediate presence of the Father. But you're asking me, are there examples? If God has made the perfect provision, are there people in the Bible that made use of the perfect provision and they became pure in heart? Oh yes. You know, Jesus said, Blessed are the pure in heart, because only they shall see God. The word only is not in the English, but in the original. It's implied in the use of the Greek. Only they, they alone, will be able to see God. And if you read about anybody that eventually saw God in eternity after death, that means before the person died, he was eventually purified in heart. And let me show you a great multitude of people in Revelation chapter 7. Revelation chapter 7. I'm reading from verse 9. After this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb clothed with white robes and palms in their hand, and cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, we sit us upon the throne and unto the Lamb, and all the angels stood round about the throne and about the elders and the four beings zone, living creatures, and fell before the throne with their face on their faces, and worship God saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom, and thus giving and honor and power and might be unto our God forever and ever. Amen. And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, what are these that are arrayed in white robes? Whence came they? And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said unto me, Listen to this, These are they which came out of great tribulation, and have washed their robes, and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. You see them standing before God? You see them bowing down before the throne of God. You see them face to face with the Almighty God. You see them in the company of angels and the redeemed. You see them in pure white without a thread of black in their dressing. What made that possible? They had made themselves white in the blood of the Lamb. That's a perfect provision. They made use of that provision. They became white. They became pure. They became holy. And there was no anger, no sin, no defilement, no pollution, no spot, no wrinkle in any of their hearts. And therefore, they were able to come before the presence of God, worshiping God in the days of eternity. But then, can we find a, a particular example? Because that's just a multitude. Oh, yes. In fact, you cannot exhaust the Bible as you see the people that became pure in heart. And my question to you is, do you desire it? Do you really want it? Are you really praying for it? Are you really telling the Lord, I know I'm saved, but oh Lord, uh, this heart of mine, I want it purified and cleansed 
you know, totally purified that there is no spot or wrinkle within it. And you'll be able to come into the blessing that Jesus said, Blessed are the pure in heart, they shall see God. Let me give you some examples. In Genesis chapter 5, purified persons. Genesis chapter 5, I'm reading from verse 22. And Enoch walked with God. How did he walk with God? With his head? Or with his hands? Or with his legs? Uh, does that mean uh, Enoch walked with God from one city to the other? No, that's not what it says. This is talking of the condition of his heart. This is talking of the, the purity of heart that he had within him. He was in total agreement with God because Amos tells us you cannot walk with God except you're in agreement with God. How do you agree with God? Was the head, was the hand, was the feet? No, was the heart. And Enoch walked with God after he begat Methuselah. 300 years and begat sons and daughters. And all the days of Enoch were 300 Sixty and five years. And Enoch walked with God and it was not for God took him. That's an example of a man that was pure in heart. It's possible and it's necessary. In Job chapter 1. Let's read the testimony of God concerning Job at this time. Job chapter 1 verse 8. And the Lord said unto Satan, As thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that fears God and is true as evil. That's a man pure in heart right there that God is testifying about. Isaiah chapter 6. I'm reading there from verse 1. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon his throne, high and lifted up, and his strength filled the temple above it to the seraphims. One had six wings, with twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another, and said, Holy, Holy, Holy is the Lord of hosts, the whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the door moved, and the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Then said I, Woe is me. The man was saved, he was a prophet of God already. He had been sent to Israel with a salvation message, saying, Come unto me and let us reason together. Though your sins uh, be so much, I'll, I'll just make them clean and white as snow. He was already a preacher. So don't kid yourself and deceive yourself and say, Well, because I'm preaching, because I'm prophesying, because I'm praying, because miracles are coming forth, that is enough. I say I had all that already. But now he saw the glory of God, the majesty of God. For a brief moment of time, a passing moment of time, and eventually, immediately looked at the condition of his heart, and he said, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a left coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongues of the altar, and he laid it upon my mouth, and said, Lo, this has touched thy lips, thy iniquity is taken away, thy sin is purged. That's a man there that was purged, purified, cleansed, made holy. Daniel chapter 6. In Daniel chapter 6, I'm reading there in verse 4, reading about Daniel, showing you men that were purified by the provision of God, whose hearts were circumcised by God himself. A divine operation took place in them, and their hearts became pure. Daniel chapter 6, verse 4, Then the princes and presidents sought to find occasion against Daniel concerning the kingdom. But he could find no occasion of fault, for as much as he was faithful, neither was there any error or fault found in him within his life. And in verse 20, And when he came to the dead, he cried with a lamentable voice unto Daniel. And the king spake and said to Daniel, O Daniel, 
servant of the living God, is thy God, whom thou servest continually, able to deliver thee from the lions. Then Daniel said unto the king, O king, live forever. My God has sent his angel, and has shut the lion's mouth, that they have not hurt me. Why? For as much, listen to this, for as much as before him. Before him, innocency was found in me. Why did I tell you to be pure in heart means? I told you it means to be innocent in the heart. Free from defilement, cleansed from filthiness. And this man was free from defilement, innocent from evil, and totally clean and clear, free from all, uh, you know, the nature of sin. And also before the O king have I done no hurt. Within, pure before God, and without, before the king, righteous as well. In the New Testament, in Acts chapter 15. Acts chapter 15, I'm reading there from verse 9. And he put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. He's talking about Cornelius and his household. In the Old Testament, you just see them one by one, one by one. You see Enoch, you see Job, you see Isaiah, you see Daniel, just one at a time. When you come to the New Testament, you, you just see them in numbers and multitudes and companies because here yeah, when it says God purifying their hearts by faith is talking about the whole household purified Cornelius the wife the people around there the centurions that you know all gathered with him the Lord worked an operation within them and their hearts were purified in second Timothy chapter two I'm reading there in verse 22. Flee also youthful lost. But follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace. With them, listen to this, with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. You see, it's a multitude here. It's a number of people here who have gone to the Lord for the purity of heart. And now as they pray, as they were calling upon God, they were doing so out of a pure heart. And in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, I'm reading verse 10. Ye are witnesses and God also. How? holily and justly and unblameably we again you see in the new testament paul is talking about himself and all the other people we sing he knew about sanctification he taught the people around him and he said you could see it when we came to thessalonica and you saw it not only in me but in all my companions that came with me you are witnesses and god also is a witness how holily and justly and unblameably we behaved ourselves among you that believe. As ye know, how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you as a father does his children that he should walk worthy of God who has called you unto his kingdom and his glory. In um, Second Peter chapter 3. This second epistle, beloved, beloved, I now write unto you, in both which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance. Oh yes, they were purified. The question is, is it possible? You better believe it, it's possible. And you go beyond that, it's even necessary. Has anyone ever received and enjoyed this provision to be pure in heart? I've just shown you that a multitude have enjoyed this provision since the world began. And of them I've given you enough. Job, Isaiah, Daniel, Zechariah, also is in the New Testament, in Luke chapter 1, Cornelius, Paul, and multitudes of others. You see, if I'm going to have this, what personal preparation do I make? As to pre personal preparation, listen. The experience is coming from God. This is the work of God alone. But then you have a part to play in this. In... Second Corinthians chapter seven, verse one. This talks of the human part, the human factor. 
I mean, therefore, these promises dearly belong. Oh, yes, there are promises that God has given to us in Deuteronomy, in Ezekiel, in Isaiah, in Titus, in Ephesians, in Hebrews, in Hosea. Many parts of the Bible having these promises that we can become pure in heart. Let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh. Let us cleanse ourselves. Let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and the spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. But you said, uh, preacher, that holiness or purity of heart is not the work of man. You are right. Why then does it say, let us cleanse ourselves? It's telling you your part. That when you really want to, when you really want to be clean and you really want to be pure, there is a part you have to play. And the things that are outward, the things that you can deal with, you deal with them to show that you really want the Lord to come in and purify you and cleanse you and cut away the evil nature from you. Uproot it, take it away from your very heart. And until you do your part, you do not show that you are sincerely desirous for God to do his part. In Second Timothy, chapter 2, verse 21. Second Timothy, chapter 2, verse 21. If a man therefore purge himself from these, purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor. Sanctified and meet for the master's use, prepared unto every good work. Then it tells you in verse 22, flee also useful lost. If you really want to be purified in the heart, uh, there are some things around, uh, some pollutions and some defilement and some evil, some corruption around you. You run away from them. You don't stay in evil and then pray that God will come and save you from evil. You don't stay in defilement and pollution and then be praying at the same time God will come and rescue you from where you are really de delighting and staying there. You flee them, you purge yourself from these things and then God with the sanctifying grace and power and the blood of Jesus will come in and totally purify your heart and purify your life. In Romans chapter 12, Romans chapter 12, I'm reading from verse 1. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is a reasonable service, and be not conformed to this world. But be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. There is consecration that comes in. That is, you are to consecrate yourself as we are asking the Lord to do his part and make you holy, make you pure. The only way you can be pure in heart is to first realize you have an impure heart. And to become dissatisfied with it. You are saved. Outwardly you have changed. Your behavior on the outward is, uh, you know, wonderful. And people are even commending you because of the change of life you have. Uh, but you know the anger that is bottled within the defilement that is bottled within, the desires, the laws that, you know, that is within, the defilement within, the secret tendencies of the heart that the Lord knows you have in the heart of yours and that renders your heart impure. The outward actions may be all right. The outward behavior and conduct may be commendable, but then how about the heart? You become dissatisfied with the condition of your heart, and then you get rid of whatever stands in the way of your becoming pure. You cannot remain passive in the matter, and then say that you want the purity of heart. If you are passive and quiet and silent about it, it's an indication you are not really desirous. You read God's word. You see the lives of those who are close to God, so that a great desire will come into you to be, you know, to be pure in heart. And then you live in the light already received. You know, if you have got light on salvation, and you are not living in the light of that salvation, you cannot move forward and say, God, come and sanctify me. If you have got light on how to live, how to dress, how to behave, how to conduct yourself among the believers. If you have got light on how to pray, how to seek the face of the Lord, how to consecrate yourself, and you are not walking in that light, you cannot ask for more grace and more light and for more of the operation of the outworking of God's, of God's power. But it's only if you are walking in the light you have already received, saved, 
reading the Bible, designing the fellowship of the believers, and doing the best you can, you know, to show your sincerity that now that you are saved, you are having a changed life. It's only after that you are really showing God, I want more. If you have not made use of what you have already got, why should you be given more by God? So the person that wants to be pure in heart, the person that wants God to reach out his mighty hand and purify him, is a person that, you know, is telling God, Oh God, I'm walking in the light I've received, and everything that I can do by myself, everything has been done. You have saved me and you have changed my life, but now I want the purity of heart. And then that leads you to praying. And I come to persistent prayer. Persistent prayer. My brother, my sister, let me be frank with you. This is not claiming it. You can't claim it if you are not given. You know, if you just came to me and, you know, I locked my door, locked my box, and I didn't allow you to take anything, and just, uh, you know, come to me and say, I-, I claim it because I know I need it, and then you go away. You have claimed it, I have not given you. You have not received it. It's not in your life. It's not in your possession. But you have just claimed it. And you know, many people like that behave in the Christian fold. They come before the Lord and a one-minute prayer, a two-minute prayer, they claim sanctification, but they never possess it. If God has not given it to you, you can't claim it. If God has not come with his purifying surgical knife, spiritually to remove away the Adamic nature from you, you can't claim it. If God, by the washing of the blood of Jesus Christ, has not come in to wash and cleanse and purify your soul and your heart and your innermost being, you can't claim it. This calls for persistent prayer. Look at Psalm 51 verse 10 again. Psalm 51 verse 10, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. That's prayer. That's prayer. In Osir, chapter 10, verse 12, Sow to yourselves in righteousness. Reap in mercy. Break up your fallow ground. You see your part that you are to play? Break up your fallow ground, the hard heart, there that is not sensitive to the will of God, to the word of God, to the requirement of God, break it off. Read your Bible. See what God requires of you. For it is time to seek the Lord. We have played long enough. You have been coming to this church long enough. Enough is enough. How long will you continue to carry the heavy heart, the stony heart, the unyielding heart, the insensitive heart? How long will you continue to carry an unholy heart, unholy emotions, unholy desires, unholy ambitions around with you? It's time to seek the Lord till He come and rain righteousness upon us. He will only do it if we come to seek Him. In Luke chapter 11, Luke chapter 11. Reading there from verse 5. And he said unto them, Which of you shall have a friend, and shall go unto him at midnight, and say unto him, Friend, lend me three loaves, for a friend of mine in his journey is come to me, and I have nothing to set before him. And he from within shall answer and say, Trouble me not. The door is now shut, and my children are with me in bed. I cannot rise and give thee. I say unto you, though he will not rise and give him, because he is friend, yet because of his importunity, he will rise and give him as many as he needed. And I say unto you, ask. No, Jesus was talking of persistent prayer. A type of prayer that makes sure that you really get the answer before you leave. He says, ask and it shall be given you, seek. And ye shall find, knock and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh, receive it. The one that claims without really asking does not receive. The one that is just making the positive confession, oh yes, I believe God, I believe God. God has done it, God has done it. After you have said that over and over and over, didn't you find the defilement and the pollution and the anger and the pride and the cells still in your heart? 
it's a serious matter. It's not something you just, you know, go around saying, I claim it by the grace of God. I know it's done. I know it's done. Amen. If you are really serious with purity of heart, you will not behave like that. And Jesus is saying, really ask, and it shall be given you. Really seek, and ye shall find. And really knock, and it shall be opened unto you. Because everyone that asketh receiveth. And he that findeth, he that seeketh, findeth. And to him that knocketh, it shall be opened unto him. It's God alone who can do it, and he has promised to do it. But then we must pray. Ask God for the fulfillment of the promise. How did David receive? By praying. How did Isaiah receive? By praying. By asking God. Indeed, the provisions of God may remain unenjoyed by anyone for many years until, you know, someone is desirous enough to ask persistently and to ask in faith. Listen to me. Before John Wesley discovered purity of heart in the Bible. Wasn't it in the Bible? Oh yes, it was there. In the dark ages, when people did not talk about sanctification, did anybody get sanctified? Not as we know. Until the 13th century, when, you know, some people as individuals were seeking God, and God was sanctifying and purifying them. And John Wesley came to, you know, put some order and some structure into the doctrine. But it was in the Bible all the time. And all over the centuries, even though healing had been in the Bible, there were people that carried the Bible along and they were never healed by prayer. And even though the Holy Ghost baptism is in the Bible, there were people that never were baptized to the Holy Ghost. It's there, but you will not have it until you pray. You desire, you ask the Lord with persistent prayer. And the purity of heart is possible. It's all over the Bible. And it's required, and it's necessary, compulsory. But until you ask, ask persistently, it will not be given to you. Now, the promised privilege. Matthew chapter 5. I'm reading there in verse 8. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Now, what's the meaning of this promise? You know, to see God is the whole purpose of our seeking after God. It is the ultimate goal of every endeavor. And that is promised to only the people that are pure in heart. I am telling you something. The fulfillment of this promise is broad, wide in scope. There is a sense in which we see God now when we are pure in heart. And there is a sense we shall see God, uh, you know, when we die and we go to heaven. It spans both time and eternity. There is a present partial fulfillment and there is a future perfect fulfillment of this promise. What does it mean right now to see God? You know, the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 11 verse 27 that Moses behaved as if he saw the invisible God. And Jesus was talking to his disciples in John chapter 14, verse 7 to verse 9. He that has seen me has seen God. And today, when you see Jesus in his saving power, sanctifying power, in his healing power, in his miraculous power, it is mighty and upon you in the sense that you're seeing God. Because the more you see the work of God, the work of Christ at Calvary, the more you see God. He that has seen me has seen God. But more than that... Look at Job chapter 42. I'm reading there in verse 5. I have heard thee by the hearing of the ear, but now mine eye sees thee. He was in trouble. He was in sickness, in calamity, in bondage, in oppression, on the end of the devil. And he heard the word of God. But then he said, even though I was hearing you by the hearing of the ear, now, now, mine eye sees thee. What did he mean? Was he seeing God with the physical eyes? Oh no, he saw his healing, he saw God. He saw the power of God, he saw God. He saw the mercy of God, the deliverance of God, he saw God. Listen to me, the pure in heart shall see God. And when you see the hand of God, the might of God, the power of God, the healing of God, and the miracle working power of God working upon you, that is seeing God. And only the pure in heart will see God in that measure all through their lives. In Psalm 63. 
Psalm 63. I'm reading from verse 1. Oh God, thou art my God. Early will I seek thee, my soul thirsted for thee. My flesh longeth for thee in a dry and thirsty land, where no water is, to see thy power and to see thy glory. So as I have seen thee in the sanctuary. You know what David is saying? David is saying that when I see your power and I see your glory in the sanctuary, then I'm seeing you. You know, today the pure in heart will see God in his sanctuary. You know, a man can come to worship at the house of God. He sings the songs. He hears the word of God. And yet, you know, he never really sees God in the worship. But blessed are the pure in heart. In the very sanctuary of God, he'll be able to see God because he will see the glory of God and the power of God. In Psalm 68 from verse 24. They have seen thy goings, O God. Even the goings of my God, my King, in the sanctuary, the singers went before, the players of instruments followed after. Among them were the dancers playing with timbrels. Bless ye God in the congregation. Even the Lord from the fountain of Israel. That's still saying that there's a sense in which you see God right now. And I've read to you before Proverbs 22 verse 11. Because of the pureness of heart, the King of glory shall be your friend. The pure in heart can see God in a sense that nobody else can. There is a sense, you know, in which we see God, which means we know Him, we enjoy Him, we enjoy His presence, we bask in His glory. And when we see the hand of God upon our lives, upon our hearts, upon our circumstances, that in a sense is seeing God, but then there is a future fulfillment, and this is exciting and just wonderful. A day is coming when we shall see the God of heaven face to face. What a glorious day that will be. You know, we're going to spend that eternity in the glorious presence of God. And what this verse is saying is that eventually we'll see God. We shall be continually seeing God ourselves. Not with the physical eyes, but with the spiritual eyes. We'll go on seeing God. And you know, the more pure we are here in this life, the more of God that will be seen. Purity of heart cleanses the eyes of the soul that God becomes spiritually visible. And as somebody has written, when I in righteousness at last, a glorious face shall see. When all the weary night is past and I awake with thee to view the glories that abide, then and only then, Will I be satisfied? Do you want to be satisfied without really seeing God? I'm sure you like to see God, but the condition is you must appear in heart. I end up with uh, First John chapter three. I'm reading verses two and three. First John chapter three, verses two and three. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it does not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. We shall see him as he is. And every man that has this hope in him purifies himself, even as he is pure. Blessed are the pure in heart. They shall see God. Rise up and let us pray.